Hello and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to World Sustainable Procurement Day. Uh, very excited to have everybody here. I'm very excited to talk to you about and present our next session of the event, which is uh, entitled New Rules, New Regulations, and What Can Procurement Do to Achieve Compliance? And we've got some uh, great, uh, a great speaker lined up for today's discussion. Uh, before we get going, I uh, just wanna make sure everyone is fully aware the session will be recorded and we will encourage you to interact and have questions. We're, we're gonna steer the questions towards the end, but we wanna make sure that you have the opportunity to engage. So please put those questions into the chat and we'll make sure that we have the opportunity to ed, uh, address them at the end. And we want you to spread the word online as well. We're, we're trying to make sure that we continue to get the word out about the Sustainable Procurement Pledge, what we're doing as a community and what our purpose and mission is. And we really appreciate all the support and the energy you're bringing to this cause. And we're building this amazing community and I've seen such great progress since I've been involved since 2021. And I'm very privileged and happy to feel like I'm making an impact in, in, in the procurement world as it relates to sustainability. Fantastic. All right, so let's move on to the program. Uh, the agenda for today, I'll do some quick introductions uh, and then I'm gonna hand over to our uh, fantastic speaker in a moment. We'll have Q&A and then we'll get into the closing uh, session. So today, so I want to introduce our uh, US uh, co-chair leadership team, if I may. So my name is Ryan Neat. Uh, I'm currently in the role of Vice President, Direct Procurement at Mark Anthony Brewing. I've been involved as a co-chair uh, with the US chapter of the Sustainable Procurement Pledge since 2021, and it's been an amazing journey. My co-partner uh, and uh, co-pilot has been Anthony Fuller for the last few years, and, and Anthony will introduce himself at the end as he uh, does the outro, but he's currently the global head of sourcing at Mitsubishi Tana. Tanabe Pharmaceuticals, and he and I have been uh, steering the ship here, uh, but we would be lost if it weren't for uh, our wonderful co-chair uh, in the wings here, Augustina uh, Cadonis, who's been an amazing uh, leader and resource to us to help uh, bring some structure and drive the, the chapter forward. So uh, we're, we're, we're very privileged to have this team together working on this important cause. And now I'd like to introduce our speaker for today, uh, Lauren Rogue is currently the partner at uh, Ernst & Young's Climate Change and S Sustainability Services team. And I wanna say that I, I had interacted with the EY uh, team in my current role at Mark Anthony. And uh, the reason for us having this session is I was so impressed with the, the, the leadership, the ideas, the expertise that they brought to the, the work that we're doing here at Mark Anthony, that we embarked on this discussion about how they could participate in, in some of the work we're doing with the Sustainable Procurement Pledge. But uh, Lauren's career is, is quite impressive. Uh, she works across a range of sectors. She's uh, a leading expert in the field of sustainable procurement practices uh, and is, is actually an attorney as well. So uh, amazing credentials. We're very privileged and pleased to have her here. And I'm going to turn it over to uh, Lauren to kick off the discussion. Lauren, over to you. Thank you, Ryan. And hi, everyone. Happy World Sustainable Procurement Day. Um, it's a real pleasure to be invited to speak to you, and I, um, I'm excited for what might be a little bit of a challenging task to speak for 50 minutes on all of the ESG regulation going on, but I'm going to do my best to try and demystify that for you all. But more importantly, talk about what, um, what it means for procurement and how, what procurement can do to support um, compliance with a lot of this regulation. So um, we need to start with a quick disclaimer to say, please don't consider anything I say as, as um, you know, legal or tax or accounting advice. I would say that particularly given the fact that these regulations are changing quickly. Um, and so, you know, I want to make sure I'll, I'll we'll, we'll give you the current lay of the land, but they, they continue to change. Um, so we wanted to start with a quick poll question so we can get a, just get a sense of um, where you all sit within um, your your organization. So if you um, can respond to the question on the screen now, it's just asking where you sit within your organization. That would be great. Okay, so a lot of procurement folks, um, which is expected, and then um, or procurement supply chain folks, and then um, sustainability as well. So that's great to see. Um, 
and we'll dive in. So um, I want to start by, as, as Ryan alluded, I've, I've had the pleasure of working in this field for more than a decade and so really seen um, companies evolve their sustainable supply chain programs over time. Um, and I've seen a lot of the kind of drivers behind that. And I think today we're really going to be focused on the one that's, um, you know, sitting there at the top around regulation that's really emerged over the last few years. And I'll share a little bit more about what that looks like. But I did want to remind everybody that, you know, that is just one of the reasons for doing this. Um, and I think it supports a lot of these other reasons as well. I think a couple that I'd call out is that, um, you know, essentially a lot of this is around just good risk management or um, responding to a lot of drivers that are, you know, causing companies to need to rethink how they're creating or protecting the value of their organizations. And I think nothing speaks truer than that if we look at um, some of the, the climate impacts we've seen over the last few years. In fact, in 2023, we experienced 28 storms and weather events in the US that were over a billion dollars, which is um, an all-time record. Usually that number sat somewhere for many years around eight um, billion dollar storms. So, you know, I think we've we've seen personally um, you know, in our own lives, but certainly as organizations in our operations and in our supply chains, the, the devastating effect that climate change can have um, on our ability to, to operate and to get our products from A to B. Um, you know, we also see the, um, I think, uh, the rising demands for human rights and social justice. Um, and I, I often reflect on the fact that when I first started my career, we were, I worked a bit in supply chain and we were really focused on, you know, labor arbitrage and how could we get the products that we want um, for as cheaply as possible and where can we get, um, you know, where can we get that lower cost of, of um, labor. And I think now I work with companies who recognize that um, they don't even, they want to be even paying, making sure they're paying minimum wage. They want to be, um, you know, many are looking at whether or not they're paying a living wage to people that live, you know, that are working in their value chain. And so I think we've really come a long way in terms of how we think about the importance of, of those value chains and of the workers that are supporting our products and services. Um, and I'm sure we're all aware of the, you know, the devastating numbers that we see when we think about issues like human trafficking and forced labor. Um, you know, more than estimates of more than 50 million people across the world in, in, in forced labor. So we're going to talk about that topic a lot too. Um, all is to say, you know, I think um, this has led to a number of drivers from stakeholders, whether it's your investors, um, you know, trying to stay off the news, uh, out of the newspapers, um, trying, you know, trying to make sure you don't have shareholder proposals. Um, I think there's a lot of uh, reasons why this is so important. Um, in addition to, of course, being able to comply with the regulation that's coming. So with that, um, We'll, have, we'll take a look at this view, which is really just to show a snapshot of just how extensive it's become. And if you look at the dates on most of these, it's actually in the last you know, two, three, maybe maybe five years that we've seen this, this plethora of um, ESG or sustainability re regulation popping up around the world, primarily in, in the US, in EMEA and Asia PAC. Um, there are a lot of common themes to this regulation. It's, it covers a lot of human rights and modern slavery, as, as you see. A lot of it is around broader ESG reporting requirements and then also around you know climate change and greenhouse gas emissions reporting so while there's common themes um and and certainly you know basic things that you can do to, to to comply with all of it it does create this very complex landscape for those trying to to understand what regulation um you know companies are um, required to do and then you know how best to respond to it so I know that's no uh, easy task and of course this is not even entirely exhaustive we have you know if you if you bring in packaging plastic extended producer responsibility there there's even more that have implications for businesses and supply chains um, so I think you know today we're trying to we'll focus on a few um, I want to dive into like a few of key key pieces of regulation here um, but I guess to start with interested in another polling question to get a sense of where you feel your company's level of readiness is to, to respond to these um, regulations. So uh, we've given you a few options here from poor, which is you probably don't even know yet which of these regulations apply to you, um, to you know a little bit more awareness, to progressing, you have a bit of an action plan on what you need to do, or are you, um, are you all compliant and ready to go? So keen to see where people feel they're at. Give you a second. Okay. 
OK, so it looks like most people are sitting in progressing. So 50% of folks um, were in progressing. I don't know. I can't see the results anymore, but and um, there we go. And uh, and then about one third of you um, somewhat aware. So I, I guess um, like sounds like a lot of a lot of work still be, to be done. And then there's one person who is um, top of the class and ready to go. So hopefully this session will be helpful in um, in sharing a little bit more about um, the specifics of some of these key pieces of regulations, particularly those that relate to companies with operations in the US. Um, and then, you know, as I said, we're going to dive into a little bit about how you can um, how you can develop those action plans to to respond to them. Okay, so there was a uh, on that world map. There was a lot of uh, pieces of regulation. The ones we're going to focus on today, as I mentioned, uh, is a bit of a selection of those um, that have you know greater implications for U.S. companies in particular. Even though some of these um, so some of these come out of the U.S. and a couple of them out of um, Europe. Uh, they cover a broad range of topics, but you can see there's a couple that really focus on the forced labor um, discussion, um, being forced labor regulation, the Uyghur Forced Labor Act, and the California Transparency. Um, a couple um, that focus on greenhouse gas emissions and climate risk, and then um, the supply chain due diligence. And then, um, you know, I think we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the CSRD, which is that broad ESG reporting. Um, and I think as we go through these, I'm really going to try and give a sense of how these are relevant and why these are important from a procurement or supply chain standpoint. Um, and I think another another um, thing to be aware of as we go through this, you know, I'm, I'm conscious not the, the, th the thresholds or applicability for some of these regulations are, you know, are not going to apply to all of you. Um, but the there's also, you know, a, such a strong trickle down effect with a lot of these where, you know, as particularly if you look at things like CSRD, it's going to require many of your business partners, many of your corporate customers to have to be getting information on their supply chains. And so, you know, everybody is going to start to need to be um, thinking about these issues and collecting data in a new way. Um, and so I think having a really strong, even if they're not, if you're not required to comply with them, having a good awareness of what's required is really something that's very helpful. Um, so let's dive in to a couple of the specifics. So I want to start with California Transparency Act, just a high level, I think many of you might be aware of this one because it actually has been around since 2012. Um, and it was one of the first um, sort of forced labor human trafficking regulations that came about um, and really requires companies to disclose whatever efforts they've undertaken to eradicate slavery and human trafficking in their supply chains um, and to do so under a few topics being um, verification, audits, certification, accountability and training. And so um, the thing about this one is, so it's applicable to many companies, anyone with um, operating in California with revenue over a million um, US dollars. Um, but it's been, you know, it's been a piece of regulation that's been around a while, but doesn't have a lot of requirements in the sense of it doesn't actually require companies to do anything. It's only requiring you to disclose what you are doing. And so I think that's really, you know, the 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 difference of where we're moving now is if you, as we start to look at some of the uh, regulation that we're going to talk about, it's really asking you to do a lot more around performance and um, put in place actual due diligence processes and then talk about them publicly um, rather than just sort of allowing you to decide what what you're um, what you're willing to disclose on. Um, so if we move to the next one, um, the other key piece of forced labor regulation in the US is the Uyghur Forced Labor Protection Act. So this one came about a little more recently. It was enacted in 2022. Um, and it's interesting because again, it doesn't have any specific requirements on companies in the same way that if you look at the German Supply Chain Due Diligence Act or um, the CS3D that I'm gonna talk about in a little bit as well, some of the other modern slavery type regulation is does require you to put in place due diligence processes, policies and things like that. This one doesn't, um, and this is really the, the currently the, the chief piece of regulation in the US that's governing um, forced labor topic. But it does um, require, it is requiring companies to really look at their supply chains and think about their due diligence processes. Reason being, um, essentially this places a burden on companies that are importing goods um, that if they're coming from the Uyghur Xinjiang region in China, um, they're 
there could be assumption applied that they are made with forced labor. So if the CBP, the um, Customs and Border Protection, decide to um, detain those goods at the border, and they, they will do so if they have concerns about them being sourced from the, re the Xinjiang region, they will do if they um, if they feel like they're coming, there's connection in the supply chain to one of their like known entities that they, they've flagged as high risk, um, or even if they are sort of a high risk commodity, which can be things like tomatoes and cotton and silicon and electronics, um, those goods may be detained. And then the burden of proof goes to the company to have to demonstrate um, that those products were not made with forced labor. So, you know, I think this is one of always the sticky areas with forced labor, very difficult to prove a negative. Um, but really what it requires is therefore you do have that due diligence, you have that um, supply, that visibility of your supply chain um, to to be able to quickly respond to uh, a, a detainment order like that so that you can quickly say, well, it was, you know, track your supplier to fr from the tier one through the supply chain um, and gain the evidence you need to be able to say that it wasn't either, it didn't come from the Xinjiang region or, uh, you know, that it wasn't made with forced labor. Um, so an interesting, an interesting law, we are seeing a number of detainments um, from the CBP. Um, I think really, you know, really, it's really driving a lot of companies to have to um, enhance that traceability and, um, and put in place um, some of the due diligence processes, even though it's not as explicitly requiring those as some of the other regulation is. Um, so we'll move now to the CSRD, the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive. Most of you have probably heard about this one. This is probably the most significant piece of ESG regulation that we've ever seen. Um, and it's uh, a requirement, requires companies to publish a um, consolidated sustainability report starting from, for some companies it will start next year, but otherwise it's kind of phased in over the next few years. Um, and it will be, um, uh, and, and that you have a sh external assurance over that report as well. Um, so you can see listed here is the um, the applicability requirements. So there's thresholds with which will determine whether or not um, your organization or specific entities within your organization would be required to report under the CSRD. Um, and re so really for, this will include many US companies that have entities um, that meet those thresholds, so 250 employees, um, and 40 million um, turnover in the US. Um, and then you you would then, sorry, in Europe, and then you would be required to report under either specifically for those entities, if it's just one or two jurisdictions, um, or many companies are just taking a sort of consolidated approach and reporting um, for their entire organization. And um, the penalties for non-compliance will be quite significant. So um, it's, you know, it's something that has driven, you know, sustainability with finance, with a whole lot of SMEs. I'm sure anyone in procurement with companies reporting under CSRD are involved in this one. Um, so, so really the, the interesting thing about the CSRD um, regulation is, you know, it has very specific requirements on what needs to be disclosed in that sustainability report. But in terms of the topics, um, so whether it's, you know, whether climate is a material topic to you or human rights is a material topic for you, is, uh, is a question of whether um, that you have to determine as a company by going through what's called a double materiality assessment. So this is a process whereby you will map your value chain to look at sort of the the end to end um, value chain of, of um, where you're making products, where you're sourcing ingredients from, where your operations sit. Um, and then look at the ver the various ESG t issues, um, and there's 37 listed in the CSRD as well as any additional that might be relevant um, that are that aren't listed there. And you have to think about materiality um, from two angles. One is um, an impact view, so that is um, the extent to which your company is positively or negatively having an impact on people or the environment. So. Examples for particularly for supply chain might be um, the extent to which you know your operations or your um, use of suppliers are um, exacerbating issues around poor working conditions or child labor in your value chain, um, or it might be a positive impact. So the extent to which you know programs you have um, with working with certain uh, commodities and, and farmers might be having a positive impact um, on the communities. Um, so that would be the impact side. Um, and then the financial materiality 
is looking, so whereas impact is looking sort of inside out, financial materiality is asking you to look outside in. So looking at where these issues might be having a financial impact on your organization. So that would bring in things like where climate change might be having a disruptive or has the potential to have a disruptive effect on your business because you know you might not your access to critical raw materials might be you know limited due to changing weather patterns or increasing cost of um of raw materials as a result of climate change um may have a financial impact on your business as well so you have to go through a, a process to determine how you would be impacted by each of those um those topics and areas um, and then to determine basically which of those topics you then need to disclose um, against. So I think um, you know it's a it's a big and complex piece of regulation, and I think there are a lot of implications for the value chain and the supply chain, um, particularly compared to other regulation we've seen in the past. Um, I think in the past we typically have seen um, most environmental regulation, particularly in the U.S., sort of OSHA requirements and things like that focused on the company's own operations. Um, but CSRD really pushes you to think about the full value chain and certainly the supply chain, um, because you have to think about this from the perspective of all of your upstream suppliers, the workers in your value chain. And importantly, it's not just um, your tier one suppliers, it's tier two and, and beyond that is considered to be in scope there. Um, and so, you know, it's not surprising. And then also the value chain sort of on the other side as well, thinking about the end users and the implications there. Um, so I think it's not surprising given we all know that the, the impacts and the ability for impacts to occur on the company tend to be more significant when you bring in the supply chain. Um, it's, it's definitely the place where a huge amount of our sustainability risk sits. Um, so it's not surprising that value chain is so core, core to this piece of regulation. Um, but as I say, any company going through this process will um, will certainly need uh, procurement or supply chain heavily involved in first that double materiality assessment process. And then once you've done that process, there'll be very specific um, sort of policies and goals and processes um, that need to be and KPIs that need to be disclosed against for each of those areas. Um, so no doubt would be involved in that. I think that's one of the other differentiating factors of this regulation is um, unlike that California Transparency Act I was talking about, this one really does require you to have um, to be reporting on performance. Um, so it is, you know, it is looking at asking you, it's asking you to set policies, set goals um, and, and report on the progress against them. And I think one of the other really um, critical pieces, it's a a smaller part of the requirements, but it it does the regulation does guide companies to use real data um, when uh, when engaging with your suppliers. And so, as you would know, when when you were, were reporting a lot of supply chain data, we're often relying on a lot of estimates, particularly for things like scope three emissions. Um, CSRD is pushing companies to, insofar as their um, efforts are reasonable obtain real data or actual data from its value chain. So we'll start to see more and more companies asking for data specifically from the um, from their suppliers. Um, and of course that may that may be implications for for companies such as yourselves asking for that data. But I think also that's where you'll start to have more and more questions from your corporate customers asking you for specific data. Um, for the purposes of them being able to complete their scope three information, for example. Um, I think similarly, you know, the human rights data um, will be um, has often been based on you know risk assessments and in, inherent risk assessments. We'll see more and more expectation that you know real data is is being obtained from suppliers through this process. Um, so I think overall, you know, uh, the the implications for supply chain on this one are, are pretty significant, and the, the need for involvement um, as well as um, as you know really driving that enhanced data collection and, and reporting. So we'll move now to the CS3D, Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence Directive, but um, affectionately known as CS3D. And I, for any of you following this one um, would know it's been a bit of a emotional journey. We've seen this regulation evolve through the EU legislative development process. Um, so I apologize, this slide is actually already out of date as of last week. Those applicability requirements are currently a little higher than what's in here. So they're, um, 
they've moved up to basically if you have more than a thousand employees and 450 million dollars of, of um, global revenue that may change again um but it it has um it has this one just as it's gone through the the regulatory process has changed in terms of you know who it would apply to so it will it will likely apply to ultimately apply to you know if once voted on or if voted on in in april a, a smaller number of companies than had originally been intended um but still the requirements have um are, are sort of still the same as what's set out on this slide where we the expectation is for companies to um, perform due diligence over their own operations and their supply chains um, to make sure that they're doing they're putting in place measures to both identify and address actual and potential human rights and environmental impacts associated with that value chain so with their operations and their supply chain so you can see there's quite a lot of overlap between the csrd and what that requires um, so um, there, there is overlap, but this one is really um, a little bit more focused on that um, that due diligence process. And it is this is something that you know we've also seen in things like the German Supply Chain Act. So what this is trying to do is to create that level playing field across the EU, so that um, you know all companies are required to have the same level of diligence in place. Um, and uh, it'll be one that we start to see again. You know, if you're not directly caught by this piece of regulation. Um, you will likely uh, be asked more and more questions by your corporate partners as they conduct their due diligence over their supply chain. Um, so I think the uh, the key rec oh, sorry, just I was going to say the, the key requirements of that um, CS3D are um, that you have a policy in place to um, to to manage your due diligence and then processes to identify, assess, and prioritize um, potential adverse impacts. So a lot of folks already have that in place, you know, a way to, to look at your, your supply chain, whether you have 5,000 5, suppliers or 50,000 suppliers, you need, a, you need a way to sort of map who those are and identify um, where you have higher levels of risk based on, you know, it might be based on the commodity that they're providing to you. Um, the types of processes that that um, supplier is undergoing or the geography that they're based, and then to perform more in-depth assessments where you have identified higher risk suppliers. Um, so that's something a lot of companies are doing, but it will um, require that to be done on a you know more formalized process and then to report on it. Um, also then to address anything that you come up with. So that would be through action plans or um, the regulation really emphasizes the importance of contracts and contractual guarantees from your suppliers um, and sort of um, investments that you can make in order to address um, where you've identified there to be specific issues, whether that's human rights issues or working condition challenges, or it might be environmental issues, um, you know, looking at things like pollution or, or climate change as well. And then um, the regulation really talks about a last resort of terminating contracts where that's appropriate, um, which is something that you know, companies have tended to be a little bit more reluctant to do. Um, and so, you know, I think that there's also provisions around the importance of having a grievance mechanism so that um, anyone along that supply chain has a way to raise concerns to the organization. Um, if they are uh, around these topics and that there's a process in place to address those concerns as they're raised. Um, and then uh, you also need processes to uh, measure the effectiveness and then report out on this as well. So it's quite comprehensive, but I think this one, um, as I'll get to a little bit later in terms of ensuring compliance, you know, this one really sets out what we would think of as the um, you know, a really solid foundation for a good due diligence process that I think will drive, you know, compliance to a lot of the other regulations. It's very similar to what's being required for um, CS3D or a good forced labor program um, or CSRD. So, um, you know, it's something, it's, a, it's something regardless of where the re regulation goes in the next few weeks, um, we're seeing a lot of companies starting to put a lot of those activities into place. So next up, I'm going to talk about the climate regulation. So um, there was a bundle of regulation passed in October 2023 in California, three rules um, that I'll just touch briefly on. I think many of you probably know they're currently subject to um, some litigation. Um, but in the meantime, since even um, 
preparing this presentation, we also had the SEC rule pass, um, which we've been waiting on for about two years. So the culmination of the California rule, the SEC rule, um, you know, I think we we are expecting, and then there's some other um, bills in place as well. Um, it certainly would be expected that in, in the next couple of years, you know, regardless of where these ends up, companies are going to need to be reporting on one, their scope one, two, and three emissions, um, and two, their climate risks. Um, so that is the, the overall effect of, of these two. So um, Senate, uh, Senate Bill 261, which is one of the pieces of one of the rules, um, sets a requirement for companies with operations in California and a revenue of over 500 million to do um, basically a climate risk assessment to understand what are your main climate risks and what are you doing to address those. Um, so that will be uh, once the litigation is, is sort of passed, um, it's due to start in about 2026. Um, the implication for supply chain on that one would be really that um, as you're, as you're doing those climate risks assessments and um, the regulation, much like all of it, much like the SEC, um, requires or expects you to consider the task force on climate related financial disclosures as the key framework to do so. Um, you know, you're really going to have to look at not just the impact of climate change on your own operations, but also within the supply chain. So to what extent, again, those those physical um, billion dollar storms or the likelihood, the increased likelihood of extreme weather events are going to impact, you know, your operations based on where your supply chain sits. Um, and, you know, and many more things. I think that's having a good um, sense of the climate risks associated with your supply chain is, is going to be a critical piece there. The second bill is um, Senate Bill 253. That is um, for companies with uh, more than a billion revenue um, operating in California need to disclose their scope one, scope two and scope three emissions and have that um, assured by a third party. Um, so that would be, um, again, similarly, I mean, if you're caught by the CSRD, you have to do that or, uh, already. Um, but this one would start in 2026. And many companies are already making sure that they have those, those inventories and trying to improve the quality of their data. And so again, for supply chain, you know, it really brings in that scope three, um, which is things like, you know, the emissions associated with the, the products that you buy. Um, that kind of information, you it, it, it's harder to get. I think you can rely on estimates to an extent, but really looking for, um, you know, you need to look for th towards your third parties, your suppliers to give you a lot of that information. Um, and then the third bill is the Assembly Bill 1305 um, or the Voluntary Carbon Market Disclosure. And that one requires companies operating in California that make any claims around net zero emissions or carbon neutral claims um, to disclose certain information about the offsets that they're purchasing um, to uh, sort of comply with those claims. And so this has been, you know, this one's been, um, had a lot of attention recently. We've seen a you know, huge number of companies, probably many of you have set net zero targets and use offsets as part of your carbon strategies to, um, to achieve that. Certainly EY does. And, you know, I think we, we, can, we have to be careful because um, of, you know, the, the ability for those offsets just to be not the level of quality that that's needed to make sure that those those claims are legitimate. So there's been a result of you know a number of companies being accused of making misleading claims or um, for purchasing offsets that fail to actually achieve the reductions in emissions that they said they would. And so I think this one actually you know has, has a huge implication the importance of procurement to get involved if you're not already because um, those essentially are procurement decisions on, you know, what what quality of offsets you're going to purchase. So, um, you know, if you're not involved, it's a really good area to, or, you know, the renewable energy strategies that you're procuring as well, um, to make sure that they are, that the offsets you're buying are, in fact, um, you know, credible, saying that the, they're saying that they're doing this, the things they do, and to go through a, a process, to a diligence process, to make sure that um, you feel comfortable with that internally, um, because you will need to make um, more, much more significant disclosures around those um, through this regulation. And I think that will start to become, you know, common practice more broadly. Um, you know, a big asterisk next to your net zero target um, against that that sort of describes the the offsets that you're using. Um, so I think those, those again, these this regulation is kind of currently on pause. Oh, we just lost our presentation for a minute, but um, we've. There, but I think as as I said, you know, between um, between those bills, between the SEC rule, um, we do expect 
um, the, uh, the the requirement on companies to be able to disclose their emissions and the the key key financial um, climate risks, um, as well as some of the, some qualitative things around governance and risk management, to be to become pretty soon a requirement for for most or many um, U.S. companies, and so um, need to be kind of ready for that or ready to be um, responding to the information requirements. The other, um, we won't go into in too much detail, but um, in addition to that, there is a federal contractor greenhouse gas and climate disclosure rule also um, uh, in play at the moment, currently in pause, but that one requires the same level of disclosure around scope one, two, and three emissions and um, a TCFD disclosure for any company that's doing business with the federal government. I'm just gonna... One second, I'm just going to grab the presentation. So that is, um, you know, trying to give you a snapshot of the, the rules and requirements, and I think a key key point to take away there is that there is a lot to do, but it is, um, there is some really common themes throughout, particularly as we think about what that means for supply chain. So I want to move on to spend a bit of time on what you can do to achieve compliance. And, you know, I'd like to say this is easy, but um, it's, it's not necessarily straightforward, but I think there's a few things you can do, certainly as a no regrets approach, given um, you know, aware that some of these, some of this regulation is still in flight. Um, so there's a few key things that you can do that that make sense to do given the direction of travel, but also just given that it's good risk management and some of those drivers I spoke about initially. Um, so the first thing is, you know, I think what one thing that's, you know, I think overarching in how to think about this is um, companies need to have a better handle on what are the key risks and opportunities. So those topics down the bottom. Um, what are the most important things for them in their supply chains? Um, like what's most relevant to you based on on what your what your value chain looks like? Um, you also need to um, be looking for ways to enhance your visibility and, tra and transparency, whether that's through um, you know asking more questions of your suppliers, investing in technology platforms that exist to be able to do more detailed supplier mapping, um, whether that's directly or using a lot of AI technology to, to map supply chains. Um, and then across the top, I think I like to make sure we think about this holistically. I think there can be a tendency to think about this just from a sourcing perspective and just from a how do we how do we engage with our suppliers on these topics. But I do think it's important to think about this from end to end process, because a lot of what you can achieve from a sustainability standpoint really starts at the product design stage um, and then flows through to how you source the products, manufacture them and ultimately dispose on, of them. Um, and so I think, you know, if you're only asking your suppliers to to help you manage the risk on this behalf, on, on your behalf, you're sort of um, neglecting part of the story that allows you to really make, I mean, particularly when you think about um, decarbonization across your value chain, the opportunities really sit um, in the, you know, often in redesigning your products so that um, they're um, more, more, um, carbon friendly products are more disposable. Um, but I think if we get more tactical, the next slide really dives into some of the key um, components of what you can do to, to really build out a sustainable supply chain program in alignment with a lot of these goals. And you'll see a lot of this is what I talked about, particularly in the CS3D um, requirements, but, and uh, you know, this is what a lot of what is built around for CSRD as well. But um, I think if you want to make sure you've kind of got the key components, I'd be looking towards seeing if you have first, um, you know, a strategy, goals and good governance around these topics. And that starts with that understanding of, you know, what is most material to you? What do you need to be focused on? Uh, what goals do you want to set? You know, I think the, the CSRD and the CS3D are requiring companies to set goals in alignment with a 1.5 degree scenario. Um, and so you need to, you know, set those climate goals, but thinking about what that means for your supply chain as well. Um, and then governance, particularly with supply chain, you know, I think um, most, of, most of you folks are from procurement, many of you are sustainability, you would know that 
supply chain can't do this alone. It's a critical player, but you really do need to have a partnership with, um, certainly with supply chain, um, but also with, you know, finance, legal, and other, and R&D, and other aspects of the business as well. So setting up that governance. Um, policies were, were part of most, um, most of the regulation we talked about. So ma making sure your, whatever commitments you've made um, are updated in your policies. Um, and those might be internal policies or made public as well. Um, and then the core piece is really, you know, around that risk assessment. So having good processes, good technologies to be able to, you know, scan that that huge um, po portfolio of suppliers you have to be able to, um, to adopt more of a risk-based approach to who you're going to focus your efforts on. So, um, you know, certainly you can, um, a lot of your suppliers will be lower risk or um, there'll be less opportunity to engage with them. Um, so it's about identifying where you have that greater opportunity and who, which, which suppliers you need to focus on. And then I think that fourth bucket, preventative and remedial measures and supplier engagement is really where the work is and the rubber hits the road. Um, and that's where you would um, be addressing those risks and opportunities that you've identified. So, um, you know, where you've identified human rights as a heightened risk, um, that you're working directly with those suppliers through, you know, contractual agreements or updating your RFP process so that you're asking questions early enough or conducting on-site audits to be able to verify, um, you know, claims that they might be making that they're, they have human rights policies and, and good practices in place. Um, this is also where you would you would put your decarbonization um, plans for how you're going to, um, you know, de decrease carbon across your supply chain, um, as well as that grievance process I was talking about to make sure that, you know, even where you do have um, where, where issues may come up that um, workers in the value chain or others have the ability to, to escalate those through the company. Uh, and then finally is the data and reporting. So a lot of this is about metrics, particularly, you know, the scope one, two, three reporting requirements um, is about getting the right data that you need and the, the right level of quality. So um, as this now becomes, you know, legal filings, um, particularly the SEC and the CSRD rule, um, you know, we want to make sure that that data is robust. So um, investing in the right systems and processes to make sure that the data is high quality and there's the right level of process and controls around it. Um, and this is really, again, where um, that this data um, is going to be not always easy to come by. It's going to require, you know, engagement with your suppliers um, in order to, to improve the data quality that you, that you need. Um, so when we go to the next slide, I'm completely aware that um, these things are not easy to put in place. And as I work with many companies, um, they they often raise a number of challenges to me of what you know why this is so difficult. And it's everything from um, the lack a lack of business case in the organization, or not knowing where to prioritize, to a lack of visibility, limited resources, um, not enough collaboration within the industry, so they feel like they don't have leverage or they're doing it alone, um, or just challenges in engaging in suppliers in a meaningful way. Um, I think that that one's a big one. Um, so curious as we as you look through that list, and I know you've been sitting listening to me for a while, but um, just a reflection in your own experience, why, where, and why you might have. Um, some difficulty, um, and there might be other things as well. But curious if you have, and you can select more than one if, if there's more, more than one of these that presents a challenge for you. I think I have to, so I don't know if you can all see the results, but we had the um, the lack of resources is the number one response to that, um, as well as sort of the lack of prioritization, followed by lack of prioritization business case and not kind of knowing where to begin. Um, but certainly uh, with one, one, in, one third of you at least um, saying that, you know, lack of ownership or resources is the challenge. So this is a lot to implement. And so, you know, I think that that governance or knowing, you know, hire, hiring the right folks or just starting to embed training is is sort of some of the critical things that need to be done. Um, 
And I think the, um, if you can just go back, Christina, the, the, you know, the flip side of those challenges, of course, is that, you know, we need to be thinking about the, the real benefits that can be derived from this. And of course, number one being, you know, it's, you're going to have to do it. Um, a lot of this is going to be required by those, those different regulations. But um, I think we, it's important not to lose sight of the fact that, like I said at the beginning, this is also about risk management and, and um, protection and creation of stakeholder value and responding to a lot of those different stakeholder, investor, customer, consumer expectations. Um, so we see a huge amount of value to be derived from doing that, you know, whether, you, whether it's being able to differentiate yourselves from your peers. Um, you know, we've seen a lot of companies say that by working with suppliers that have um, better ESG performance, we've, we've found we have more resilience and we've found we have um, that they're more um, just generally um, higher quality suppliers. And so you start to achieve, you know, cost savings, efficiencies, it changes and things like that. Um, and then, of course, for those um, who feel strongly about this one, this also helps us, you know, address some of our systemic global issues around finite resources or climate change or advancing social impact. So, um, Good to keep those in mind as well, particularly if for those struggling with, you know, with the business case for doing this. Um, and um, and then, of course, the compliance piece. So um, I think we had one more poll question. I'm going to skip over it. But just this just I know one thing I like to say is, um, you know, this is a journey for everybody. And I think it takes um, years to build a program that gets you to the place where I think we're all going to be expected to get to with a lot of this regulation and so I would say start now but um, it's also good to think about whether you know what your ambition is do you want to be just comply with the regulations and standards and, and meet the expectations nothing wrong with that um, do you want to be more like um, of an optimizer and looking for ways to really gain that efficiency and, and opportunity or are you you know is, is this the area that you want to be a leader and really transform and work with partners to to transform the industry so um, we won't do the poll on this but something to reflect on in terms of um, you know where, where you think you sit um, and then I think I had one more slide to finish on which is I know I've given a lot of um, of sort of details on the big picture what you need to do but just to kind of take it to maybe a slightly more tactical level to finish um, if you're wondering you know where to start tomorrow um, I think these are these are really five no regrets activities that you can think about focusing on so the first is just you know incre increasing your understanding of um, of these regulations that it's a lot to keep up with it's a lot to understand um, but also your stakeholder expectations just gaining that understanding two would be work on that visibility um, in your supply chain. And that could that could start from any companies with just having a better view of your tier ones. Um, you know, I think we I, I spoke to I speak to many companies who's who don't who still don't have a good view on where where a lot of their products or um, commodities are coming from. And then three, I think if you haven't already um, there'll be there'll be no question that at some point in the future you'll need to report your scope one and two emissions and possibly three and do a TCFD risk assessment. So that would be um, an exercise worth undertaking if you haven't already. Um, that takes again a few a, a few iterations to get that data and and those assessments into a good place so that you feel comfortable disclosing them. Um, and then I think there's a there's a ton of work to do around internal ex, internal education. Um, getting those roles and responsibilities signed, and then starting to think about how to engage with suppliers on these processes. Um, so it's sort of more tactical pieces to finish on. And then I think that's where we close. I know we kind of have one minute. I didn't leave quite enough time for Q&A, but um, maybe we can take just like one or two quick questions. And then I do know we will be making these slides available. So um, although bear in mind, as you saw, some of them have already a little out of date. Um, but happy to take, also happy to take sort of more specific questions offline. I know there's probably a, a ton of more specific questions, but anything, maybe Augustina, was there anything that jumped out at you that we should? Yes, there's one question that is um, in the Q&A box. Um, mm -hmm. Is it possible to cover CSRD and CS3D in one go? Mm, that is a good question. There's um, certainly a lot of overlap between the two. Um, one thing being that they both have a requirement for that 1.5 degree um, climate transition plan, um, and then they're both asking for um, an understand a way to assess and understand risks across the whole value chain. Um, I think that um, there are some nuances 
that will mean in particular in terms of the the, the question as to whether um, the the definition of materiality um, at the CSRD level will will give you um, will be all of the topics that you then want to perform the due diligence for CS3D is probably is probably one question to to consider. Um, but I would say a lot of the processes will be um, will overlap and and cover each other off. Um, there'll just be some some nuance probably in the extent to which that due diligence process um, covers all of the environment and human rights topics that are required under CS3D. Any, any other burning questions? Otherwise, we can, sorry. I, I think we're at time, okay. so, um, but if we can spare one more minute, <laughs> we can answer one more question before any, like, uh, speak. So, um, what is legal's role in preparing? Does legal yeah. need to guide procurement about what the legislation regulation is asking for? Yeah, it's a great question. I think we've seen, uh, I think legal has been involved for sure, given these are legal or compliance, given this is this is now a compliance exercise. Um, so the typic, typically um, for, for most of this regulation, we see a combination of sustainability, finance and legal driving a lot of it. Um, finance, because this information is now going to have a lot of data. Um, that needs to be, you know, investor grade data. Um, and so they're, you know, making sure that the, the finance group and the controllership and the audit committee are comfortable with it. Um, but I think equally making sure that the, the provisions themselves are covered is where getting legal involved is, is critical as well. Um, and then of course, you know, so procurement's role is not, um, you know, there's certainly parts of CSRD that are relevant to you. So procurement, I would see getting more involved in, um, in some of these and more of an as needed or as an SME kind of basis. But I think certainly we're seeing procurement, um, sustainability, finance and legal really becoming best friends more and more over the, the result of a lot of this regulation. All right. Okay. Great. Well, that was absolutely a wonderful presentation. So thank you very much to Lauren and Christina and our colleagues from EY for this great presentation. It's been extremely informative. I'm sure we've learned a lot today about what is obviously a very dynamic legislative and regulatory space. I think it's important for us as procurement professionals to, to know what the underlying rules are, so to speak, that makes it much easier for us to work with and educate suppliers who may not be directly impacted by, for example, CSDDD or the California legislation. So once again, a huge thank you to the EY team and to our audience who joined us today. Uh, special thanks also to my SPP USA colleagues, Augustina and Ryan, for their immense hard work in preparing and hosting this amazing event. We're not the last session on the WSPD agenda, so if you're able to, please stick around for the remaining presentations. But with that, have a great evening, everybody. Thank you again.